Unfortunately, there's no verse in the children's hymn book about prophets regarding Abraham. He was a prophet, and he's regarded as the source of three of the world's largest religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's important, too, to think about Abraham the individual, his family, and what we can learn about faith through examining his life. What does it mean to be a child of Abraham? What legacy did he leave for fellow disciples? And how do we account for the story of Hagar and Ishmael? We'll discuss that and more in today's episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm a public communications specialist at the Maxwell Institute here at Brigham Young University. Christian Hill is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we'll be discussing the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we're joined by one of our research assistants, Julia Evans, who is pursuing a degree in linguistics and is preparing to attend law school. She has worked at the Missionary Training Center for a year as a Norwegian teacher and then as a training supervisor. Currently, she's involved in undergraduate research in several areas of linguistics and has strong interests in religion and philosophy. Welcome, Julia, to Abide. Thank you so much. And Christian, we have a lot to dive into today. We're covering Genesis 12 through 17 and the book of Abraham chapters 1 and 2. What's going on in this section? From our vantage point, it seems that one major function of Genesis 1 through 11 is to provide the genealogy of Abram. With Abram, later Abraham, we are finally on firm footing again. This is the father of the covenant. We are his children and we worship his God. But none of the cosmic importance of Abraham is known in Genesis 12 verse 1. Instead, as the notes to the Jewish study Bible observe, with Genesis 12, the Lord begins anew, singling out one Mesopotamian, in no way distinguished from his peers as yet, and promising him land, numerous offspring, and blessings. These extraordinary promises come like a bolt from the blue and an act of God's grace alone. This lone Mesopotamian is given one command to begin with, Lech Lecha, go forth in the Jewish Publication Society translation, leave or get thee out in other translations. God's first words to Abraham, as far as we know, are an imperative and a promise. Leave everything you know behind and come follow me, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. From this point, Abram's story is one of difficulty and hope, pressing forward through trial after trial until, in response to the ultimate act of submission, Abraham hears a voice from heaven declare, Now I know that you fear God. In the book of Abraham, another precious and curious gift from Joseph Smith's prophetic ministry, Abraham is no random Mesopotamian, but a light seeker, a follower of righteousness, who wants to possess greater knowledge so that he could be a greater follower of righteousness and possess greater knowledge still and become a father of many nations, a prince of peace. And because of this, he became a rightful heir of the priesthood given to Adam. Abraham was led and taught and protected by God from the beginning, rescued from a land of idolatry plucked from the hands of those who would offer him up as a sacrifice to false gods, and promised that he would be made a great nation. This great nation would not only embrace his natural posterity, but as many as receive the gospel. Thanks for that, Christian. It's always wonderful to hear the ancient Near Eastern context to what we're going to be discussing. With the Abrahamic covenant, he has promised that he will have children as numberless as the stars in the sky or grains of sand on the seashore. But what does it mean to be the children of Abraham? We're dealing here with both literal and spiritual children of Abraham. And so when we talk about the promises of Abraham, these are promises that are both inherited through one's bloodline, but also given as an act of grace or as, an, as a, um, a function of the priesthood. So in the New Testament, for example, we read in Galatians 3, which is a lovely chapter on the promises of Abraham, that the real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God, and all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessings 
Abraham received because of his faith. So we're starting to see a different sense here of who the children of Abraham are. Through Christ Jesus, it says in verse 14, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. So how does this work? Paul believed that Jesus was the means by which the promises to Abraham would be fulfilled. So this is why he taught that Christ was actually the child promised to Abraham, ultimately looking forward. He is the child through which all the families of the earth would be blessed. So that becoming a child of Christ through baptism made all Christians the children of Abraham too, as his spiritual descendants. At the end of this chapter, he says, you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promises to Abraham belong to you. Yeah, I'm remembering Jesus is saying in the Gospels that he could raise up stones that would become the children of Abraham, pointing to the literal bloodline maybe not mattering as much. Why is Paul talking so much about literal bloodlines not mattering? Do you think that it has anything to do with the gospel going to Gentiles as well as to Israelites or Hebrews? Precisely. I think Paul is breaking down this barrier between those who are literal descendants and those who are not, and creating a th theology that allows not only Gentiles to receive the message of the gospel, but to receive all the promises of the scriptures, remembering, of course, that for Paul, the scriptures are the, our Old Testament. And so all of these promises that are given in the Old Testament, are given to Abraham, are now alive in this new, these new Christians who cannot look to their ancestors for these to, to be heirs of these promises, but instead look to Christ. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it this way before, but Paul is really universalizing the ability to become a child of Abraham. He is a proud Jew. He's a proud descendant of Israelites. And thinking about the universalization of access to salvation through the atonement of Christ, this must have been very different from what Jewish people would have been hearing previously, that they were the chosen people that going outside of the 12 tribes of Israel would have been seen as not only worthless, but possibly blasphemous. Yeah, I think that, that we have this sense of things which belong to a people by right, by lineage. And Paul is not, I think, negating that, but extending, opening the doors further and saying there are other ways in which people can become the heirs of the children of, of Abraham. And so in our own Restoration Scripture, we see a similar thing happening whereby the promises of Abraham are open to all who are faithful. And so in the book of Abraham, for example, in, uh, in Abraham chapter 2, the promise to Abraham sounds slightly different than what we viewed earlier um, in Genesis. It says, in thee, that is, in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is, thy priesthood, for I give unto thee a promise that this, shall, this right shall continue in thee, and in thy seed after thee, that is to say, the literal seed or the seed of the body, and shall all the families of the earth be blessed even with the blessing of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of eternal life. And so one element of the restoration doctrine of the priesthood is, is indeed the importance of the rights that come through lineage. So in the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn that Abraham received the priesthood from Melchizedek, who received it through the lineage of his fathers until Noah, and from Noah until Enoch, and then back to Adam. So we are concerned about lineage, and we are concerned about the blessings that belong by right. But there's this other important idea is that the blessings of salvation and the blessings of Abraham come through adoption. And adoption is really one of the most beautiful doctrines, I think, that God has, has revealed. And so this adoption happens through the familiar passage of the oath and covenant of the priesthood, which reads, For whoso is faithful unto the obtaining these two priesthoods, of which I have spoken, and magnifying their callings to a calling, are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and of Aaron and the seed of Abraham and the church and kingdom and elect of God. So this beautiful doctrine of becoming the children of Abraham and heirs to the promise through sanctification of the Holy Ghost opens up again all of the blessings of the patriarchs to the entire world, this time 
through priesthood restoration. Sticks out to me, though, that everyone still has access to be blessed by the priesthood, whether it's in a linear fashion or coming down from lineage, or whether someone has no connection to the tribes of Israel. They, too, can have access to the blessings and for men to be ordained to these two priesthoods. It strikes me, again, as universalizing. That restoration scripture is saying, yes, when Jesus Christ was born in the Meridian of time, he immediately preached to Jews and his apostles preached to Gentiles in the surrounding area. But Joseph Smith's vision is so much more grand that he's saying, not only are the people within an immediate vicinity going to be blessed, I'm going to restore and thereby open up the priesthood so that it can be accessed by every person on the world. And not just every person in the world, but every single person who has ever lived through vicarious temple work. It just seems to me that Joseph Smith's grand vision is always how many people can be saved and how are we going to accomplish it? Yeah, that's lovely. And I think that's and so true. And Joseph manages to maintain this balance by valorizing, keeping the importance of God's ancient covenant people remembering those covenants that God has made over time as being the cause and the means by which salvation is administered, and then having this broad, expansive vision in which all of humanity sort of brought into and swept under the umbrella of, uh, of these covenants. What about Abraham himself? Uh, what do we learn about Abraham, not only through Genesis, but through the book of Abraham about his biography as an individual? So within the space of three chapters, Abraham has gone to Egypt and back, been blessed with great wealth, settled in the land of Canaan, battled with local kings to retrieve Lot and his property, been blessed by King Melchizedek of Salem, and paid tithes. His wealth has grown and his fame has spread, and God's promises are being fulfilled here. But he has no issue to inherit either his wealth or his name. And it's not yet clear how God will fulfill the promise to make his offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth. The opening of chapter 15 suggests that Abraham may have thought of adopting his steward as his heir, but God protests, none but your very own issue will be your heir, it says in verse 4. So the promise made to Abraham and Sarah in Haran is still years from being fulfilled, Yet when God takes him outside of his tent and shows him the, scar the stars of the sky and adds, so shall your offspring be, Abraham believes. He trusts the promises of God. And thus you find, says an ancient Midrash, that our father Abram inherited this world and the world to come only as a reward for the faith that he had. So the Jewish Study Bible at this point adds a really poignant note. Um, in the Tanakh, it says, that is what we would call the Old Testament, faith does not mean believing in spite of the evidence. It means trusting profoundly in a person, in this case, the personal God who has reiterated his promise. So this is, a, 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 I think, a profound insight into faith, because we often think of, of faith in precisely those terms of the thing that we believe despite the evidence. But for Abraham, faith becomes uh, is trust in God's faithfulness. It's a trust that God will fulfill his covenants. And God is so serious about fulfilling his covenants that he performs this, has Abraham performed this unusual ritual, which seems a bit sort of strange when we read through it, this cutting up of the animals and laying them out on each side. And this unusual ritual seems likely to be the ritual of self-curse known elsewhere in the Bible and in the Mesopotamia. The one who walks through the cut animals accepts the penalty to be similarly cut asunder if they do not uphold their covenant. And God demonstrates his faithfulness by symbolically walking through these cut animals. This kind of one-sided covenant, this promise of ob obligation to perform cer certain things, with no obligation on Abraham's part, is known as a covenant of grant which, as the Jewish Study Bible says, is a reward for past loyalty and does not involve any obligation upon the grantee. That just seems so different from how I understand covenant as a modern Latter-day Saint, always thinking about it as a, a two-way relationship, thinking about it more as a legal contract. What does it mean to you that there's this one-sided grant covenant rather than a two-sided covenant that 
you or I entered into at baptism or at other points. I think what we see here, and, and we'll see it again through, throughout the story of Abraham, is this God's extravagant generosity towards his children, this desire to bless and to show his love and to give blessings to his children. And this is uh, this interesting sort of contrast that we see between uh, the Genesis account of Abraham and the Restoration account. In the Restoration account, Abraham is this seeker who is sort of rewarded by God. And in the Genesis account, we, we have somebody to whom God appears and blesses him and makes him the sort of father of the entire world, as it were. And there doesn't seem to be any reason for this. He's just taken, chosen, and blessed. And sometimes we want to feel, I think, as though we deserve blessings, that there is some sort of contractual, we've done our part, God done his, but it's a, it's a, a transactional event. But all of salvation is ultimately this grand gesture of extravagant grace. And I think that's what we see in Abraham here. I love that because I know that I can get bogged down in thinking about covenants as sort of a spiritual Amazon prime where I've paid my tithing. So I'm expecting in two days, the exact blessing that I need right at this moment. The idea of thinking about the extension of grace is thinking I will take care of the whole of you not only the part that is in the most pain right now, God's timeline is just so much longer than ours. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, and I think that we, we're precisely in this situation where we stop, th because it is a sort of a, it's always a both hand. I think this is the, the, the lovely thing. But the, at the center of this idea is having this trust and faith in the person of God, in God's faithfulness, in God's commitment to fulfilling his covenants. And I think that is the great revelation here, as we read through the Old Testament, is the revelation of the character of God, which Joseph Smith said is the first principle of the restored gospel, to know this character. And as we start to let the Old Testament teach us about the character of God, rather than bringing our perceptions of the character of God to it, I think we start to achieve something really wonderful. Now, another person who had to learn to trust in God's plan for them, that his grace would be extended throughout their entire life, not just in an individual situation, was Hagar. And Julia, could you tell us more about Hagar's situation and what you thought about as, as you were researching Hagar for the podcast? Yes, of course. So first, I'll just kind of recap and summarize what is going on with this story a little bit. It's one of those where you read in the Old Testament and you might stop and go, wait, what? <laughs> what, what just happened? Abraham and Sarah promised to have a child. And then many years later, I believe it was about 10 years after that promise, Sarah convinces Abraham to take their servant, an Egyptian woman named Hagar, the surrogate mother for her. She can't conceive. And so she says, okay, well, we need this promise to happen somehow. And so she thinks of that idea and, and Hagar becomes Abraham's wife. And so Hagar, Hagar conceives and all we don't we don't get a lot of details about the story exactly what happened between Hagar and Sarah, but we can imagine there was some tension and conflict going on there so much that Hagar decides to run away in the wilderness. And I just can't even imagine how she would have felt. I'm sure she felt just so many different emotions of feeling despondent and hopeless and probably a little bit worthless. Like, what what am I really doing here? What role do I have? Well, especially because she's brought in as a wife to help fulfill God's promises and right. then things aren't working out the way that she expects them to. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that happens so often, I think, in our lives as well, which is why it's such a, an important story. So yeah, so she's in the wilderness and this incredible thing happens. I, I think it's really a miracle. So an angel of the Lord comes to her. I'm not sure if it's an angel of the Lord or the Lord himself. I imagine it's an angel on the Lord's behalf sent to comfort her. And she's told that her son, Ishmael, will make a great nation. And we know that to be true now, that the sons and Ishmael of Ishmael and that their descendants are what make up our brothers and sisters in the Islamic faith. And they're very important contributors in the world and world religions as far as theology goes. A very important part of, I think, Abraham's original promise that his seed will be great, that it'll be made great. Gar is comforted by this angel and she gives the Lord a name. She's the only person in the Bible that we know of to name the Lord something. And she says, it's in Hebrew, El Roy, which means the God who sees. And I just think it's really beautiful because up to that, I'm sure she felt like not seen in any of the roles she had leading up to that, right, as a slave. And then not even as a wife, a real member of a family or anything, but as a surrogate mother. 
and then she probably feels hopeless and then god comes and just validates her and comforts her and blesses her and she feels seen for probably for the first time in her entire life yeah i also think about how many times in the scriptures that the lord or an angel gives instruction to someone and i always think about the period right after Mm -hmm. that happened Mm -hmm. um For instance, you mentioned Islam. After Muhammad is visited by the Archangel Gabriel, he questions his sanity. He wonders, like, (laughs) did this really happen to me? Is this something that I can straight facedly tell other people about? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's always this sort of liminal space of saying, yes, I've been visited by an angel, by a heavenly being. But then recognizing that there's a moment after that where you have to trust that Mm -hmm. what the person said is actually going to come to pass. Julia, what did you personally gain from learning this story? Yeah, very great question. Great question from that. Her story is so interesting. I I think there's not really a one answer or one size fits all interpretation of this story. I think you would be going too far to say this is what we are supposed to learn from her. You know, she's a person and she had a life and a lot of cool things to contribute. But for me, I feel validated. I feel like it's okay to experience what I'm experiencing and to feel the emotions I have. I I feel seen no matter what's going on in my life. And I think it's important to remember the elements of trust in God and then just navigating conflict and uncertainty in this story as well, when it can be tempting to just immediately go to issues of feminism, right? And that's kind of what my mind goes to initially is like, oh, like surrogate motherhood, like what is that? Like what what's going on with that? And then interpretations of marriage and other things like that. But it might be more about conflict resolution and, and trust than any of those things. Well, and I think it's important you say that, that we also think about Sarah, because as you mentioned, Sarah is the one who initiates Abraham and Hagar's relationship. (laughs) What did you think about Sarah as you were reflecting on this Mm -hmm. biblical narrative? I love Sarah. I think she's so important as well. And both women I can relate with and I think are just worthy of praise from us. But Sarah is understood and regarded to be a really strong and virtuous and influential woman. You can sort of read that with her character from the little that we have from the story in the Bible. But um, I think that she must have just been desperate. She wanted God's promises. It's not like she wanted something other than that when she proposed the idea of having Hagar come as a surrogate mother to help fulfill that promise. I don't think she was trying to go against God's will in any way. I think that it might have just been, yeah, desperation. <laughs> um, and it's so easy for us to do that in our lives. We're like, I've been promised this and I want it to happen right now. But that's not the way it works with God. Like you were saying, it's, it's a timeline that's a lot longer than we imagined. She didn't want, she didn't get the answer she was looking for when she wanted it. And so she tried to make her own. It's interesting with that theme, because you see it in other places throughout the Bible, like with Tower of Babel, that's sort of what was going on there is like the covenant they had been promised. And then they try to sort of create it in their own way. But that's not God's will for us a lot of the time. Yeah, I think all that we can ask of life is that we do what we think is best for as long as we can until we receive inspiration that it's not for the best anymore. Yeah. Well, that seems like a lovely place for us to finish today. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Christian. And we'll talk to you again on Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Head on over to iTunes or your preferred podcast provider to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, each of which are worth their weight in podcast gold. You can receive show notes, including references to the sermons and articles referenced in this episode, by signing up for the Maxwell Institute newsletter at mi.byu.edu. Please also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for more content from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Thank you.